Roger, alcoholic. Roger. Uh, October 11, 1978, in case you don't remember, John. Thanks, <laughs> Roger. John was yelling at me about He started listening to my gifts because they all start the same. <laughs> you got to listen a little further in. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, October 11, 1978, that's uh, when I started this journey. The uh, topic tonight is emotional sobriety, which is... Uh, Something that everyone's run up against and very few people realize what it is. It's, uh, it's like this. You have an acute drinking problem or drug problem or combo problem and you get help. Maybe you sober up in those treatments, you go to detox, maybe you go to treatment. You come out, you go to some of those meetings. You know, they tell you, go to meetings. Right? Go to meetings. So you go to some meetings <coughs> and uh, and uh, it's really fun for a while. Feels really good. Like it. I feel so good when I leave. And then after a while, it starts wearing off. It's kind of like the infatuation phase. It's just kind of, oh, all of a sudden you're not quite so cute anymore. And this isn't quite so fun. And it's not quite so convenient. And I'm having a little problem. I'm not telling anyone about my problem. But I'm getting a little restless. I'm not telling anyone about that because. I don't really see the necessity for this sponsor animal in my life because, after all, we are above average intelligence, aren't we? <laughs> right? So, surely, having missed the complete plot, which is the failure of self, I now get sober and I'm going to sponsor me. Right? I'm not calling it that. I'm just keeping to myself, keeping a low profile, staying out of the radar, and, uh, checking it out. And while I'm checking it out, I'm finding that I'm getting a little moody. A little moody. I have some really good days. I have some really bad days. And some of that past history starts coming into sharper focus. Now, I've been sober a month, two, three, six, twelve. And I really haven't done any of these steps. I am considering them. I've read them several times because they're clearly posted on the wall in all my meetings. I've read them, I've interpreted them, and to the better part of my understanding, I've really already done them. Right? So, not much consideration there, but interesting that they're plastered all over the place. Um, and I'm growing more and more restless, irritable, dissatisfied, right? And I don't know what that is. I don't know what's causing that because I've addressed the damn problem. I'm not drinking. Isn't that great? Aren't you all happy for me? I'm not drinking. Hence, I'm not in squad cars. I'm not in jail. I'm not in hospitals. I do have a few things pending. But, but I'm, not, I'm not really, you know, relative to where I was, things are greatly improved. And, and what... What happens is the emotions, the dark ones, resentment, anger, fear, worries, depression, isolation, those things, um, dishonesty, manipulation, those things are still pretty much my operating software. I'm doing it in a cleaner way, but it's still all there. That's my, that's my survival kit for getting through the day. When push comes to shove, I'll pull out one of my deals on you. And my favorite deal is just intimidation. And you can, once you get, once I get you trained, I can do it with a look. In the beginning, I'll have to do it with a few discussions. We call them discussions. And they're really me brainwashing you, right? But I, I teach you there'll be a high price for challenging my position. And you don't want to do that anymore. And so you end up in the middle of a room being alone. Middle of a room, alone. And everyone's going, God, you're doing so good. God, you're looking good. Blah, 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 blah. You know, God, it's nice your eyes are uncrossed. <laughs> you, your ears have quit bleeding. Shit, you are a miracle. <laughs> you know, and inside I'm thinking, no, I'm a piece of crap. Because none of what got me here has been addressed. I thought booze got me here. It certainly did. And it certainly kept me alive long enough to get here. And we I talk about this all the time. If booze was the primary problem, abstinence would be the solution. 
Not drinking would be the answer. We've all done that. And not drinking is so goddamn unsatisfactory that I end up drinking. Or I end up doing something else. I go, I'm not drinking, but I'm spending a lot of time with the Native Americans and their casino. <laughs> More entertainment. You know, because I'm bored. When I get downtime, I'm very bored. And I found casino. That's good. Yeah, right. Or I've, I've just got into a little, uh, I'm really doing kind of a documentary on my computer around uh, the evolution of sexual practices. <laughs> I understand what I'm saying. <laughs> my wife thinks it's porn. I, I'm telling her my project. Right? But I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking. But I am padding my expense account at work. And no one's going to find out. Because they totally trust me. No one's going to find out. So I find I need to pad it more. Because now I'm taking people out more often. Because I'm lonely. And, and I also like to... <laughs> shush. <laughs> and I also like to be in control of the situation. So what better? I'll take us out and I'll pay. So it's kind of like a pay-per-view audience. Right? <laughs> I'll entertain you. Right? Because I'm really not comfortable being alone. And it gets really bad at night. That's why all my sponsees call me between 11 and 3 in the morning. Say, why are you calling me now? I'm freaked out. But, but why weren't you freaked out at 8 o'clock? I was busy. I was busy. Right. And so we use activity to distract ourselves. But at the end of the day, at some point before you pass out or go to sleep, you're sitting there with all of this. And... And this uh, emotional sobriety. How many of you read this article by Bill Wilson? Oh, you got some homework. Um, it's called The New Frontier Emotional Sobriety. He published it in the grapevine at about 20 years sober. And some of you may know this, some of you may not know this, but Bill had a history of depression. And Bill tried a lot of things to treat his depression. He never tried changing his act, but he tried a lot of things. And so he talks about this, and we've talked about basic instincts, social security, sex instinct. As long as those, those are in our DNA, as long as those needs for approval and gain remain in the realm, in the range of desire and preference, we're good. When they go over the top and they become demands or entitlements, it's game on. Because now, it's not I'd like to have that new job. It's if I don't get that new job, I'm screwed. Because Tim's going to get it. If Tim's good, that means obviously Tim's better than me. And that we can't have that. <laughs> Shit, I'll have to kill Tim. <laughs> <laughs> It'll look like an accident. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? And so I don't even know this is going mm -hmm. on. And he talks about it. He says, this is, <laughs> he talks about he doesn't put it in these terms exactly, but he talks about it. Sex security instinct. Those adolescent urges that so many of us had for top approval, perfect security, perfect romance, urges quite appropriate at age 17, proved to be an impossible way of life at the age of 47 or 57. Which was how long he was there, right? um, Isn't that interesting? So when I look at those basic instincts, I'm telling myself, that my salvation, my completeness, my wholeness is in my relationship with her. Right? And so now you have become responsible for supplying me with everything I need. And now we have a very bad, bad combination of things because you can't possibly give me what I need. And so I'm going to constantly be pushing on you for more and different, more and different, more and different. Because every time I get you to do what I want you to do, it doesn't fix it. My incompleteness, it doesn't fix it. And so I move the cheese and say, now this is what you need to do. right? And we do that with relationships. We do it with sex. We do it with money. We do it with property. We do it with everything. And if I don't get hip to the game, it'll drive you insane. It'll drive you absolutely freaking nuts. Because then the game is acquisition. Because I've told myself, I need to satisfy these instincts, and the way to do it is to acquire, to acquire prestige, to acquire leadership skills, to be recognized as a leader, to acquire money, to acquire 
to acquire power and prestige, to acquire respect. Right? But when it be become demands and entitlements, that becomes a life or death struggle for me. Now when you put a nice sprinkling of shame under that, it's literally, for me, a matter of life or death. Because to not get it means failure. To fail isn't like, oh, I made a mistake. It's like, no, you're a total intergalactic piece of shit. It's like, I mean, total failure as a, as a life form. So I can't have that. So it's interesting, because Bill wrote the steps. Bill helped put the book together. He just didn't quite get it, which is refreshing, I think. Isn't it? For me, it is, because it's, what is it saying? You know, we say there are no big deals today, and you go every AA function, you go, there's goddamn pictures. Build a ball. Our icon. Mm. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <laughs> the Holy Ghost would be a dollar. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying. You say there are no big deals, then why do we have these icons up here? And then we find out the icons aren't perfect. So there's two things I'm going to do with this. Well, this is bullshit, you're a bunch of hypocrites, it doesn't work. Or I'm going to say, wonderful. Wonderful. I can do this imprecisely. I can do this imperfectly. I can do this in a flawed manner. Yes, you may. But please do it. It's interesting, because when Bill had this breakthrough, this is when the depression lift, lifted. Father Ed Dowling, the Jesuit in St. Louis, who started AA in St. Louis, non-alcoholic. And uh, there's a collection of letters in the uh, Pittman archives that handle this. And uh, I think it's called either the soul of sponsorship or the wine of sponsorship, something like that. It's a collection of letters between Ed, who was Bill's spiritual director, and Bill, going back and forth. And Bill talks to him about this breakthrough, and Ed's response is, good for you, you finally did six and seven. <laughs> At 20-some years sober. You can't know what you don't know. And if you stay in this process, it'll smack you in the face eventually. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but you can't escape it. So he's talking about these instincts, right? And then he's uh, he talks about in AA, I've taken immense wallops in these areas because of my failure to grow up emotionally and spiritually. My God, how painful it is to keep demanding the impossible. How very painful to discover finally <laughs> that all along I've had the cart before the horse. Then comes the final agony of seeing how awfully wrong I've been and still finding myself unable to get off the emotional marriage world. Now I see the truth and I still can't go to it. God, why am I so miserable? Challenge, how to translate a right mental conviction into a right emotional result and so into easy, happy, and good living. Well, that's not only the neurotic's problem. It's the problem of life itself for all of us. We've got to the point of real willingness to hew right to the principles in all our affairs. So the idea is, what he's saying is, slowly over time, well, here's, he's, he's asking. I'm asking myself, why can't the 12 steps work to relieve my depression? By the hour, I stared at the prayer of St. Francis. Better to comfort than to be comforted. Here was the formula, all right? Why didn't it work? You know some of you don't know that prayer, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one of the versions of it. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant. I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It's in pardoning that we're pardoned. It is in dying that we're born to eternal life. He's staring at this, wondering why the hell it doesn't work. And what he's going to uncover is motives. My motives, I'm doing the right stuff. I'm doing that. I'm helping people. Shit, I started AA. God damn it. I'm helping. I'm going all over the country. Everyone's getting better except me. That's a pisser. <laughs> really? That's a pisser. Well, absolutely. So, 
Here's what he discovered. <laughs> my basic flaw. I finally discovered from staring at this prayer and thinking about it. My basic flaw had always been dependence. Almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionistic dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. He's talking about basic instincts, isn't he? And what I, the, the mistake I made was I thought my satisfaction was in you telling me I was okay. I thought my satisfaction was in you getting to sleep with me. I thought my satisfaction was in building a big, helpful, wonderful, magnanimous organization. I thought that was my salvation. But the whole thing gets robbed when my motive, when my intent is, do you like me now? How about now? Am I good enough now? How about now? Do you see what I'm saying? And we drive ourselves absolutely insane trying to get people and circumstances to satisfy things in which only our relationship with God can satisfy us. Oh, shit. So, how do you spiritualize a car? Um, so, <laughs> because I had over the years undergone a little spiritual development, the absolute quality of these frightful dependencies had never before been so starkly revealed, reinforced by what grace I could secure in prayer, I found I had to exert every ounce of will of my thinking and actions to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies upon people, upon AA, indeed, upon any set of circumstances whatsoever. What is he describing? He's describing my ultimate reliance on God. And so that really hammers us into a corner, right? Because most of us come here with an unserviceable concept of a higher power. So we got it. It, it, this drives this all this inventory, all this stuff keeps driving us back to what is God to you? What is this higher power to you? Now how do you interface with it? How do you talk with it? Does it talk to you? What would that look and sound and feel like? Right? Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. And I'm busy being distracted by trying to get all of you to tell me how good I'm doing. And even when you do, I can't accept it. Because I know the truth. I know what's really going on in here. I know what I'm doing when I'm not in the frickin' meeting with you. I know what I'm doing when no one's watching. Besides that, I'm a busy thinker. And I'm thinking all the damn time. And most of it is selfish and self-centered. And it's not very nice. And I have nowhere to go with that. I have nowhere to go with that. So, this idea of turning a right idea into a right emotional result is hinged upon my giving up the need for your approval, the need to be a big deal. Doesn't mean I don't like it. I can like it. You got an award. Wonderful. Isn't that nice? I'm getting an award. I'm getting an award. March 1st getting an award and uh, it's a hoot some of you know I have uh, several lives I've lived and one of them was as a musician and where the band we're in is getting inducted into the Hall of Fame in Kansas and uh, so all the guys are calling we're going to have a reunion oh. <laughs> oh, that's right oh yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> but I'm not going oh look at me I'm going this is going to be so cool to hook up with the guys again you know what's happening? We're getting emails from all over the country mm -hmm. from people that used to follow us around. They're saying, I'm coming. It's hilarious. There's guys saying, we're listening. I just listened to the album last night. I'm going, fuck, what album? <laughs> <laughs> when we got our archives, uh, a, a few years ago, they wanted, someone wanted to put some clips up, and they had to ask permission because I had the writer's rights on everything. And I said, of course. And they said, do you have any others? I said, I don't have anything. And it turned out the drummer, who was a professor of percussion at University of Arizona had the whole archive. And he sent me all these CDs of all these tunes we did. I did a whole album. I wrote it. I sang it. I have no recall of any of the sessions. Have a nice day. You know, it's like, really? Shit. <laughs> this is a whole new kind of inventory. <laughs> so anyway, what I'm I'm not excited about that. I'm excited about hooking up with those guys. 
We had, we had, we did some shit. And uh, we haven't been, it's been 35 years. We haven't been together. Parts of us have been together, but we haven't all been together. And I don't know if we're going to play or not. That would really be a hoot. <laughs> so anyway, the point is, I'm not thinking, look at Big Deal. I'm thinking, it's not interesting. I'm glad they did it before I died. What the hell? But it's, it's, it, it's even more interesting that there are people that were still impacted from that that are still <coughs> listening to the music. That's old music. But anyway, example, <coughs> right? I don't have this absolute demand for your attention. I don't have an absolute demand to be the best everywhere in my life. I don't have it. What I have is a desire to be better. And so now my giving is for giving's sake. It's not to get approval. Everyone has had, not everyone, a lot of us. Well, let's narrow it down. I. <laughs> I'm sure no one else has had this experience, so I'll just tell on myself. <laughs> Welcome to my world. This is just bizarre. When you give to get, you get emptied out. When you give to get, you get emptied out. So I'm involved. I'm putting meetings on, I'm starting programs, I'm designing curriculum for people, I'm, it's all free of course, and, uh, and uh, I'm doing all this shit, day and night, night and day, and, uh, and I don't know this, but you know, I'm really kind of hoping someone notices, maybe a small plaque by the door. <laughs> not a big deal. I'm not talking like iconography, just a little thank you, Roger. <laughs> Something brass, <laughs> six by six, anything, you know, just a commemoration. Yeah. I don't know this is going on. This is how it feels. I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm getting more and more pissed <laughs> off. You know why? No one appreciates it. No one even says thank you. And most of these bastards aren't even getting sober. The hell's the point? <laughs> right? It can't be me. It's got to be them. <laughs> right? So this is growing and growing and growing and growing. And I have this moment. And I realize the reason you're giving is to get. That's not going to work. So you got to bust it loose. And you got to give for the sake of giving. I want to, this prayer of St. Francis is beautiful. You notice uh, the inversion, the second half. Rather than seek to be consoled, I want to be a consoler. To understand? No. To under be understood? No. To understand. Do you see? It's turning me into the observer and the witness. It's turning me into compassion and empathy. And that ends being, a, that ends being, ends, oh shit, talk. <laughs> that ends up being my source of satisfaction, my source of completeness, my sense of purpose and direction. It ends up being the very thing that feeds me, and it doesn't exist out here. It's a total attitude. It's a total come from. Huh. To be loved as to love. Huh. For it's in giving that we receive. Have you had that experience? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty interesting thing. Because I thought of it this way. I'm going to do this for you. I hope you notice. I want you on helping you. And I'll wait to see if you've noticed because you're going to help me. Right? Pretty soon you're going to help me. Any day now. <laughs> you're going to help me. It's been a goddamn month now. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't realize what I'm doing. Right? That's not what, the, that's not what it's saying. It's saying give for the sake of giving to be useful, to be helpful, to be a comforter, to be a witness. To well, Right? And it will return to you, but not from necessarily from that source that you gave to. It's a thing. It's a reciprocating energy that I'm putting in play, and it starts with my giving. It doesn't start with me receiving, because I don't receive well. I'm selfish and self-centered. And if I start getting a bunch of stuff up front, I'll just want more. It starts with me giving, and it feels like I have nothing to give. And it's a great place to be, because ultimately the only thing I have to give is my time. My time.
time. And hopefully, with that time, with that time, I have some experience that'll help. Because I'm mostly working with people like me. Drunks. Ugly drunks. Not I ran over the trash can drunks. I blew up my life drunks. One more problem with the police and I'm going away forever. Drunks. Witness protection junks. You know? The high life. You know. So you want to have something to bring to that. So this emotional sobriety idea, I can't say I have control of the emotion. If something happens in the present moment and I get scared, that's, a, that's an instinctive reaction. But I do have a choice what I do with that. And I didn't know that before. I thought I had to fix it by changing you. And you know this when you do your inventory work, you, you do your four step, you look at all that. If you got to wait for all those people and the first three columns to change before you can be okay, you are screwed. <laughs> Just go eat your gun now. <laughs> or go back to the bar because it's just you're going to drive yourself mad because it ain't going to happen. What does it say? Change how you come at this. Change where you come from. Change who you come from. Change who you be. So he's saying on... Um, Quit demanding. Quit demanding. First, I got to see that I'm demanding. And the way I see that is I'm doing this stuff, I'm giving, and I'm getting more resentful. I don't think that's the equation. Give until it hurts? No. Give until I hate you? <laughs> give until I don't want to come here anymore? I don't think so. It's kind of interesting. Some of you may have noticed. I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the reflections I've had that I've been working on, actually since I turned 60, I'm going to be 65 next month, and uh, one of the reflections I've been working on, and not morbidly so, but truthfully, there's less road in front of me than there is behind me. Period. That's a biological fact. And even if I live out to my family's average longevity, I got somewhere between 12 and 30 years left. The question is, how do I want to spend those years? How do I want to spend my time? How do I want to spend my energy? That's my life. That's my life. I want to spend it, I want to spend it being helpful. I want to spend it doing things that give my life purpose and meaning and value. I want to suck all the juice out of this I can while I'm here. It's hard sometimes because what it demands is you be present. You be as present as you can in this moment. Not thinking about the trash that needs to be taken out, not thinking about the dishes there, not thinking about anything, but be present in this moment. And that's free, right? So he's going on. <laughs> his conclusion <clears throat> he talks about watching newcomers work with newcomers and how they don't get discouraged they just turn away and find another guy to work with and they're happier than shit he said the really stabilizing thing for him was having and offering love to that strange drunk on his doorstep. That was Francis at work, powerful and practical, minus the dependency and minus the demand. So if I'm doing, quote unquote, doing all the right things, hitting all my marks, and I'm feeling less and less satisfied, look for the demand. Look for my hook. I got a hook in this thing. So. He's saying it worked for depression. I think it works for everything. I know, especially when it's... I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the common garden variety depression we have is not a biochemical imbalance. It's a distorted, messed up thought process. It's a perception problem. It's a distortion in my perception and my attitude. And funny, when those things straighten out, everything else straightens out. 
And I go, oh, it's a miracle. No, you got your head out of your ass. <laughs> That's what that is. Rectal vision is cured. <laughs> So, <laughs> so this idea, the emotions are <laughs> the emotions are generated. Follow me on this if you can. I got a feeling. This feels good. This feels bad. That's based on the perception of the event that just transpired in front of me. The stimulus. That's based on the value I assign to it, and that's based on where I'm at. So if I'm really needy, I'm really feeling incomplete and broken, and you get in the way of me getting some attention, that's going to be a problem for you. <laughs> it's not going to be for you. And I don't even know why it is that. Right? So awareness. i got to get hip to the game that's going on. Two, I got to get to a different level of understanding with it. That's the basic instincts and understanding that I'm asking the world to do for me something it's incapable of doing. I can't ask you, as my woman, to make me whole and complete. Because you can't. You can't. And if I demand it, what happens is slowly I put you on the throne of my being and all this other shit falls away. And it all becomes, in fact, I was just talking to a guy last night who did this. He's obsessing about a woman that doesn't know he's obsessing about her. <laughs> and she's texting him and she's over screwing some guy across town. He's calling me going, what should I do? I said, none of your goddamn business. Mm -hmm. What you should do is go to bed. You should pray. You should inventory. Let's do that now. Okay, we do that. I'm on the phone for an hour and a half. 5.30 this morning, I get a text. I went nuts. I got drunk. I broke my wrist. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I hope you can write left-handed because you've got a lot of inventory to do. <coughs> <laughs> what the right really you gotta lean into it a little more than that just a little more than that screw you god drive me nuts and the truth is when that happens I am powerless over that emotion but the problem is I let myself get emotionally drunk how do I do that usually negative things I get depressed I get challenged I get freaked out but you know what the other thing the thing that is the most Often the trigger for us is success. Mm -hmm. I know how to do failure. I, mean, I know how to do get up and start over again. I know how to do this till I get enough relief. I know how to do that. But you know what? I don't know what to do when it's all going great. Mm -hmm. And what we tend to do is we kick back. And we start, I start coming in our thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm doing pretty good. I made that happen. I pulled that deal off. God damn it. I am something. I'm back! Oh, shit, you with this! Oh. Right? And I, I, I just sneaks back in and self becomes enthroned again. And then I wonder, how did this happen? No self-awareness, no examination, no inventory, no prayer, no meditation. Good luck. Good luck. How can you possibly, how could I possibly expect to pull this off without that? Well, I wasn't convinced that self couldn't do it. I wasn't convinced when I was drinking. I wasn't convinced in my early sobriety that I couldn't pull this off. I couldn't figure out how to do these rules my way. I, did, I, I, just, I couldn't accept that I might need help from one of you. Shit. Yeah. Professed losers. <laughs> I mean, you sit in meetings and they, and they take turns telling you what a mess they made of their life, and then they say at the end, oh, be sure and ask one of us to help you before you go. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I could do that good on my own. <laughs> right? Or better yet, plug in the jug. I love that. Plug in the jug. Really? Plug in the jug. That's what we do. We put the plug in the jug. Yeah? Really? What else do you do? Plug in the jug. We go to a lot of meetings. A lot of meetings and plug in the jug. That's what we do. A lot of meetings and plug in the jug. Really? So every time I see you, I got him sober today. I'll tell you something. I expect to be sober today. I expect to be sober today because I'm doing what's required of me to maintain my spiritual condition. And part of that is the covenant with the power is that the obsession will be removed and it will stay away. <clears throat> Why? Because I'm powerless over that, too. When that voice comes, time to drink, oh, shit. It's not am I going to drink, it's when am I going to drink. You know what I'm talking about. 
Oh god, my mouse is killing. So, um, I found this. I don't know where, where I found it. I don't know if it means anything, but I think there's some points in it. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> is there some humor I missed? The hell? <laughs> to you. Well, here. It's titled "Emotional Sobriety Is When." So try some of these out. When I'm free of resentments, jealousy, and envy, and free to forgive quickly. My emotions are not so violent that they cause me to go or be on a dry drunk. I'm, I am able to make normal everyday decisions <laughs> without my vision being unduly influenced by emotions. And the ones that influence us most are the negative ones. Have you noticed? I don't sit around. I, it's the fear. It's the, I'm not going to get something I want or I'm not going to mm -hmm. hold on to something I have. It's the fear. And that bitch is in the game the whole time. Small voice, little voice, big voice, but it's there all the time just waiting. It's like water on the other side of your foundation. It's just waiting for a crack. Just give me something to work with. Oh, doubt. That'll do. Oh, little concern. We won't really call it worry. That'll do. Right? How about some anxiety? Free-floating anxiety, that's what we call it, because we have no way to examine it. Free-floating anxiety. Oh, shit, that'll do. Right? How about what that guy's thinking? That'll do. Everyone in this room knows this. You're clairvoyant. We're all clairvoyant. We've all done this. You walk in a room, someone looks at you and you go, What's up with that? <laughs> right? And then we proceed to spend the next half hour in the meeting making up a story about what they were thinking when they looked at us that way. And then we find out at the end of the meeting that they couldn't see at all because they got their eyes dilated at 3.30 and they're blind and shit. <laughs> For instance. Oh. I'm on a <laughs> Stop it. I'm able to identify and live by my personal values without compromise to emotional pressure. What if I disappoint you? Dare to disappoint you? Dare to disappoint you? Dare to say no? Dare to say I don't want to? Dare to say no thank you? I'm able to enjoy life as spiritual principles would dictate, such as being properly revolted by ugliness, sin, and suffering, and positively rewarded by happenings of love, beauty, and principle. I'm happy when others do things better or quicker than I have done them. But that one's so good. That's a pucker. That's a pucker. There's always a faster gun. And everyone, we're sitting in a room full of people that all think they're the smartest person in the room. Right? <laughs> How about being free of that? <clears throat> My, I'm so, what I'm saying is I celebrate your success. That's what it's, I celebrate your success. You got a raise, wonderful. I don't, my first inclination is, shit, there's less money for me. <laughs> I fell in love, I got a new guy, I got a new girl. Oh, wonderful, I'm going to, that makes me more lonely. Shit, I'll never find one. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Ever. And when I do, I always break them. <laughs> uh, here's a good one my emotions are in sync with my intellect and both are in sync with God's will <laughs> here get on the mic <laughs> he says Sarah she's laughing so hard she can't breathe <laughs> My emotions are in sync with my intellect and both are in sync with God's will. Wow. That's pretty good. I can live freely without being emotionally subservient to another human being. We're back to dare to disappoint. Right? Here's, a, here's something I learned. There's a couple things. One is, I'm in a transaction with you, a relationship with you, or an exchange with you, a circumstance with you. And then you come to me and say, you know, I just need to tell you this for my self-care. <laughs> I'm really disappointed in you. <laughs> you have really hurt my feelings. And I'm going to go, whoa, really? Now I have to look at what my motivation was, what my intent was, and how I operated. If I'm clean with that, 
then clearly what I'm in front of is your expectation has not been met, which is not my job. And this is not a fun conversation. Darling, my job is not to make you happy. My job is not to make you whole. My job is not to bring you peace. My job is to be those things in this relationship. Right? There's you, there's me, there's an us. And that God is the us between us. And we have to serve that. And if we do that, all this stuff is in right proportion. If we can't do that, there's always going to be an imbalance. So I'm demanding to have one of these instincts satisfied by you, and you can't. So it just makes me more hungry. And that's why I have a girlfriend. Because <laughs> you don't understand. And I want you to know, there are plenty of women who do understand. And I have the rationale in place for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we'll just displace this uh, honesty, you know, it's relative, isn't it? So I can move freely between emotional states of child, adult, and parent. This is a little psyche for me, but do you understand what it's saying? There are times here. You know, the book talks about us being hard on ourselves, but at the same time, compassionate, right? There's a time here, in a sense, I have to reparent me, because no one else is going to do it. The parents are dead. Well, one's dead. The other one's out of the game. So they're not going to parent me, and I quit letting them parent me when I was about eight. So who's going to parent me? Sometimes I need to parent. Who's going to celebrate the kid in me? It's going to be me. So i got to learn to when to let the kid out. Right? And I also have to learn when to be the adult. How am I going to learn that? Trial and error. Trial and error. Hmm. Huh. I derive genuine, healthy pleasure from helping others without thought of reward, money, prestige, or station. And that's uh, Wordsworth's uh, prayer. Lord, help me be free of the good opinion of others. Help me be free of my reviews. I get mixed reviews every day. I get people that think I'm wonderful, and I got people that are hunting me. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> they don't like me. Um, so if I'm going to be influenced by those reviews, then I'm going to have to have more yeses than no's every day. And even if I get more yeses than no's, I'll tell you, when I get really, really full of myself, I got a room of 100 people, there's 99 of them that are digging me, and that one person that isn't becomes my obsession. Because that one person represents my total failure when I'm in self, my total failure. And I will turn myself inside out to win you over. If I can't win you over, I'll gross you out. But God damn it, I am going to run this room. All of it. Period. I must. Right? So, so emotional intoxicants. We, we are very familiar with them. The primary ones are resentment and fear. Right? Shame's an emotional intoxicant. Guilt is an emotional intoxicant. Negative thinking. All of it. Worry, doubt, anxiety. Confusion can be an emotional intoxicant. So if I have no inventory process, if I have no way of self-examination, if I have no relationship with a higher authority, even if it's just principles, what chance do I have of pulling off happy, joyous, and free? What the hell is that? I go for content. Here, I don't know about happy, joyous, and free. I thought it was a setup. Because happy for me is delirium. I'll tell you what happy was. A quart of whiskey and five second alls. I was happy. I was peaceful. Right? I have no idea of happy, joyous, and free. But I do know this. I do know contentment. I do know purpose and fulfillment. And I know peace. And if that's happy, joyous, and free, I got it. I got it. And that is so vital to my daily operation. I mean, it's what sustains me. And so if it's in diminishing qualities, it's because of me. It's not because God has pulled the plug. It's because I've walked away. And so that pain, that emotional pain, that points me back. It's just a pointer. If I can pay attention to it and understand this, just a pointer. It points me back 
Come over here where it's warm. Come over here in the light. Come over here where you're safe and protected. Come over here. Come be with me. That's God calling. Whatever you call God, that's God calling. It's not punishment. It's a pointer. <coughs> it's been given to us. Our innate, innate wiring is we're wired for God. We're wired for connection. We just haven't been able to read it right. So when you get hip to that, your defects become your friends. They become your allies. I'm flawed. No shit. I'm flawed. In the beginning, I was ashamed of the flaw, and I was going for perfection. I must be rid of this stuff. You can't get rid of all of it. I don't know anyone that's gotten rid of all of it, but I can tell you, I probably have all my flaws I've ever had, but th some of them are in such minimal proportion that they have no effect. I mean, I'm aware they're present, but they don't run anything. They don't drive anything. And every once in a while, I get freaked out. Once in a while, I got freaked out. I got freaked out last week. I got scared. And I'm doing all this inventory. And uh, <clears throat> and I get to reset, and I come back, and I'm fine. And then I go nuts again. And I do the inventory, come back, and I'm fine. And I miss something. And it's something that I don't usually go to. <coughs> Self-pity. I was feeling sorry for myself. I didn't know, I had no idea. Now I can do a couple things with that. You're 35 years sober and you can't recognize self pity. What the fuck is the matter with you? <coughs> or I can say, you know, it's nice that self pity has been gone for so long, I didn't recognize it. It's not been one of my calling cards. Feeling sorry for myself has not been one of my calling cards. Uh, but anyway, so Francis, closing with this. Oh, here's an interesting thing I saw. <laughs> you can give without loving. But you can't love without giving. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. Because when I love, when I'm in love, when I be love, and I'm not talking about Humpty Dumpty love. I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm talking about love in an unconditional sense, which none of us have the capacity for, but we can strive for. When I can come from that, I'm free. I can't not give. I can't not. It's like when you do the steps and you have this experience, one of the things that's a byproduct of that is you want to help people. That's why so many people that go to treatment end up being counselors. Whatever. <laughs> because they, they have an experience and they want to replicate the experience. I want to be like my counselor. My lead counselor was fantastic. I want to help people. I want to save lives. Such a lot. I'm going to your school and I'm going to do it. Fine. But all of us can't be counselors. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's the deal the deal is when I've had this experience somewhere in the ninth step down there I'm going damn it I didn't even know I had anything to give you know how I found out guys started coming up to me I didn't go looking for them they came up to me and they said I'm screwed I think you're doing this I don't like you will you help me Basically, you know, <laughs> I said, I don't like you, yes, I'll help you. <laughs> it's been a great template. I don't need to be your friend. I'm trying to help you get in a position where your life can be saved. And you can have a whole new life. You know, pull your ass out of this fire and then get to a place where you don't have to keep setting your life on fire. You know, and so then I found out I had something that I could give. I had a lot of experience. I had an enormous amount of experience in what doesn't work. That should be evident if you've heard me more than once. I have a ton of experience. I didn't know that. I thought that was embarrassing. I thought it was shameful. Turns out it's gold. Oh, I've had that argument. Let me tell you where that took me. You know, by the time they get to the gun and the mouth story, they're going, never mind, I'll just do the goddamn step. <laughs> you know, fine. <laughs> and I'm amazed that they're teachable because I wasn't. But they can hear it. They can hear it. And they believe it because it's the truth. And, and, and where we hear this is in our heart, in our spirit, in our soul. It's not in our head. What happens is you hear the truth and you go, yes. And then you leave and your head grabs that and starts screwing with it until two days later you have no idea what it was. <laughs> and whatever it was now is not serviceable. Right? So um, I love Francis. I'm not a religious guy, but Francis was cool. Because Francis was a rogue. Francis 
and I have some shit in common. <laughs> and, and it was in his imperfection. It was that made him such a great asset and value because he'd been there. He'd been there. So here's a little thing he says. And the prerequisite for this is I can't give what I don't have. I can't give what I don't have. That's why when you're running around quoting the book to people and throwing slogans up their ass left and right, like I will let God. Easy does it. Whoa. <laughs> Meeting makers make it. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that shit. <laughs> they go, oh my God, they tell me how. How? Not what. How? God damn it. Sorry, I'm getting excited. <laughs> How? I need meat and I need bone. I need it together. I don't need your goddamn slogan. If you can't make it a lie to me, don't even waste your time. Give that to God. And how would you do that? And what's God? Could we start there? Oh, I'm too busy. I gotta go to Starbucks. <laughs> you know? Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Kinda. <laughs> oh shit, it's my meeting. <laughs> no, it's not. So here's the deal. This prerequisite, I can't give what I don't have. Here's how it looks. You know, I was a very intolerant, very impatient, very self-centered man. And I became more patient and more tolerant and more loving. And what I found was the level of that I had for myself was exactly the level I could give you. The level of understanding I had for me is the only level I could bring to my relationship with you. My level of grace, my level of peace, my level of love, my level of compassion, my empathy, my understanding. I could only bring to you the level that I had. I couldn't love you more than I loved me. And I didn't have a very good understanding of me. So what he's saying is, you can't give what you don't have. And so at the end of this thing, I said this. I say this a lot to you, and I believe it's true. It, it's well, I don't know if it's true for you. It's really true for me. The end of get of this whole thing is peace. And I don't mean silent night, holy night. I mean I've stopped fighting most things most days. Most people, most circumstances, most ideas. I have peace. I'm not at war. With theological systems, institutions, people, they can do what they want, just can't do it to me. Right? So when I get to that peace, then I can bring this. And he said this about helping. We've been called to heal wounds, to unite what has fallen apart, and to bring those bring home those who've lost their way. Isn't that what sponsorship is? I want to walk you home. What's that going to look like? I'm going to walk you home to the Father. I'm going to walk you home to the God of your understanding. I'm going to walk you home to the spiritual essence that you are that has gotten completely obscured by your bullshit. And we're going to peel that away with the steps, and this is going to express forward, and you're going to go, God damn. Amazing. I can't believe the man I am. I was always that man. He just got buried. He just got lost. What a bill... I always had these ideas, but you know, it was soon drowned out by worldly clamors, those instincts screaming to be fed. I just didn't get it. Just didn't get it. All right, let's take a break. We'll break till uh, 10 after, and if you want to stay, we'll talk. <laughs>